The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, and welcome to another collection of entries from website subscribers for the 2021 Orchestration Challenge. We're starting off with this <clears throat> really cool score by Roque, and it's, it's, it's really um, vivacious and lively, and, and it has a lot of color in it, and there are a lot of things I like about it a lot, like right in here, okay? But... <clears throat> There's one thing that I'm going to comment on before we dive into the evaluation criteria that everybody just saw at the beginning of the video. And that is the use of the trumpet all the way through. So I feel that this uh, is a little distracting at times. I mean, it's not just that the sound set has a very saxophone-like sound uh, because of the, sometimes the, um, like, sound sets will interpret muted trumpet to sound a bit like a saxophone. Um, and <clears throat> I think if you were to use um, a note performer, you wouldn't run into that problem, which is it's fairly cheap. I think it's, is it like $130 US or something? And it doesn't tie up the RAM on your computer. And um, I'm not sure if this is... Uh, I mean, it looks a bit like Dorico because I'm seeing the Bravura font. Um, but then it's got all these separated staves, which uh, see, reminds me of, of um, Muse score. So anyways, not sure what you were using, but yeah, but you can, I think, I think Muse score and Dorico now can use note performer. So either one, you know, you can get a better, a much better idea. But it's really not the sound set that's the problem. <clears throat> It is more the um, the continuity, right? So you've got this bum 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 ba yeah ba 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 ba, and then da 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 da, and then when the trumpet leaves off, the continuation of the melody is not strong enough in these other registers to um, to to have a, a feeling of continuous motion. It really feels like the melody has come to an end and these other instruments are just kind of commenting. They're not really leading us to the next place. Now I see that you have marked your trumpet's forte and your um, your winds are at, and strings are at fortissimo. <clears throat> so you're trying to balance the effect out. So I, I can I can see the you know the intent here to uh, to try to control things, um, but you know also here where the trumpet leaves off, it leaves a big hole, and and you you know after a while the ear just starts to get used to the sound of the trumpet, and when it when it is left out then. Um, <clears throat> Then you know. Then people are saying, "Well, wasn't this you know?" The feeling is, "Well, shouldn't there be trumpet all the way through, right?" So <clears throat> maybe it would be better to possibly 
um, just do four bars of trumpet and then have the other instruments react completely, right? And then just leave leave out the trumpet. Same thing he, again. Um, and then right in here, um, the same thing, just, you know, have other instruments take over and maybe come back in with trumpet later on where you really do need that driving sound. <clears throat> One thing that is, um, that you have to think about when you are transcribing music, and that is how much of the articulations of the original score are going to be necessary, right? So if you're, if you are scoring <clears throat> forte for for brass, and you are writing these nice short notes, do you really need an accented staccato, right? Because it's already the it's already staccato because you are writing eighth notes rather than full um, full quarter notes, and um, <clears throat> when you add the accent to it, you basically are turning it into a, a fortissimo note. So you, so it, it throws everything out of balance. Now, everybody else playing fortissimo, excuse me, everybody else playing accents in fortissimo, that sort of pushes the whole game higher. But then, you know, do we lose a sense of, um, do we, do we just start to get out of balance? That's the big question, right? So, um, I, I, so I would say, like, just really watch out when when um, importing all of the articulation marks that came before. And you know, there's another. There's also the concern here of tying a um, tying the same note, right? So, so there are two problems here. One is <clears throat> that you will accent the the grace note. And then you are saying, well, there's another accent on the next note. Usually in a case like this, if you had an accent, you had some sort of articulation style, you would put it on the grace note, right? So that it so that it carries through to the next note in the tie. But then there's the other problem of tying a grace note. Uh, in, the, in the piano score, <clears throat> it made perfect sense because the pianist was playing a single note or playing a couple of notes as grace notes and then going straight to an octave or to a fifth. But in this case, it is just a single note. So you're telling the trumpet player to come in slightly early on a note that everybody else will just hear as being the same note as you know these other Bs in these other instruments, right? So it's just like, why is the trumpet player coming in sooner? So if you get rid of the tie and you're having the trumpet player going da 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 da, that's different. But when you tie it together, the trumpet player is just going da 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 da, right? And it just takes explaining in rehearsal, right? It's you know. So do you really want that? So like, what you're sort of saying two different things here. You're saying, well, I want both notes to be accented, but I want a tie. So you have to decide which one you want, right? And then if you do have the tie without the sort of the sense of accenting both notes, then you have to deal with the fact that you're that coming in early throws everybody else's timing off, right? Now it's not a it's not a problem when the grace note is different from the principal, right? When you are slurring from E up to B. But it is a problem when you when the when it's just the same note tied. Alright? So alright, okay, so those are some things that <clears throat> I think are going to show up in other scores. So I just thought we we could talk about them here at the beginning. So now let's specifically talk about your score, Roque. So you're starting off here, um, <clears throat> and there is a concern in my uh, in my criteria: pitch, weight, and the upper metal register of the of the piano, and so on. You know, will um, is that a concern throughout the score? Well, it actually isn't because you are varying things around. Um, <clears throat> Will the thematic material sound too repetitive if orchestrated the same way throughout? So, so here we come back to the trumpets, right? So the trumpet is so loud that it is sort of throwing you into that trap of sounding the same, even though you have this beautiful expansion of the uh, of the scope of the opening, right? So, so like without the trumpet being 
as loud or maybe as present, then <clears throat> we could hear everything else that's going on here and how how beautifully informed this is, right? So, um, <clears throat> so in this case, it's you know, would it not sound repetitive if there were no trumpet right in here? Which seems like that doesn't make any sense, right? Because you, it's the same thing that happened before. Now you have a two trumpets and you have slightly different articulation style and so on. My instinct here is that <clears throat> that you know there is possibly <clears throat> something else that could be done here. You know you've got a two clarinets on the same sounding B, right? And then you've also got violas on that same B, and they're they're being very very punchy in the way that you've scored them, right? <clears throat> so, so maybe there is a way of bringing in more brass right in here, like bringing in all the brass at forte, bringing down the, uh, bringing, you know, just, just getting rid of the accents both times. You don't really need them. And, you know, scoring it fuller, you know, like, like filling in some of the harmony lower, you know, below the winds and the, this beautiful thing, you know, this beautiful scoring you've done with the winds and the strings. And then, <clears throat> and then it's not so repetitive. And then like when we apply those same concerns to uh, bars five to eight and 13 to 16, you know, we can see that you really have done different things with both of these sections. There are some similarities right in here, you know, pizzicato and the lower strings and so on. <clears throat> and, you know, some lower notes, contra bassoon and bassoons and, you know, so there's there's some similarities between the two sections, but they really are not the same, right? <clears throat> so I feel that it just, if you just lose the trumpet right in here, we can hear this beautiful scoring and, and especially this, what you've done here <clears throat> with your horns really just makes all the difference in the world. It, it, it's so nice. Uh, and you've thrown in a turn here. You know, that's that's a very cool thing, but maybe it should have been given to the, uh, the, the strings as well. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the other thing that kind of goes on and on throughout the entire first 16 bars, 17 bars, is the snare drum, right? So maybe maybe there's a way of contrasting this, like maybe this could be snare drum and this part could be castanet or some other instrument that has a similar kind of vitality. Uh, <clears throat> because it's, it just really sounds very military, right? And, and it also, like it, it's there, it takes away the contrast between the parts that you, you know, you spent all this time on building contrasts between parts and, and exploring and going forwards and it's not coming through because of the you know the continuing elements of of trumpet and and uh, snare drum right <clears throat> okay so the next concerns melodic development source quite high uh, to the uppermost orchestral register we've got this you know this piccolo arcing over and see, see this. Here's here's another problem. It's you know, ba 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 ba, ba and then higher instruments taking over, and then the piccolo coming in even higher on top of that. <clears throat> so I'm not going to say that that doesn't work. It's just that you have to be, um, you have to be satisfied with the result of the the sort of terraced registers, right? And then here, um, this is really, really cool. So you've got your triple octave in here <clears throat> with some harmonization from the second violins, which is very cool. My concern here is that you know, while you have got the oboes and, and they are taking over for the flutes right in here and filling in where the flutes would be weak, then the flutes come in, that's also really, really great. There is just really not a lot of doubling in places where it really needs it. Like for instance, here the trumpets are incredibly strong, right? But there's this beautiful harmoni harmonized uh, line that is going up like this, so we can't really hear 
the significance of the harmony in here because the trumpet is just taking over and it's and even that it's going crescendo right so <clears throat> so we don't quite get the full effect here and then furthermore we've got the piccolo way up top and then the oboe and flutes are not expressing the harmonization they're not doubling the harmonization of the um of the second violins so and this is so easy to fix too you could just have uh you could just have your oboes instead of being a2 here you could have them in harmony right so you just have two oboe parts going up to here and you take them maybe a little bit farther and then the flutes could come in and double them going all the way up to a C third here. So there really is no need. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't have both parts doubled and strong going all the way up. And then once again, I would say leave out the trumpet because it's just distracting from the beauty of everything else that you've scored here. <clears throat> and then the, there's another problem too, and that is the, the separation between these lines, right? So you're turning this cello line into a bass part but since it really is the same thing that is going on on top of it the ear wants to fill in this space right in here which could be done with like say violas and bass clarinets or the bass clarinet could double the pizzicato at staccato right um <clears throat> then uh accompaniment figures you are dealing with you know their their wider range you're picking instruments that that work perfectly well uh, in those ranges. That's not a concern. Um, the upper middle register continuing on without contextual contrast, you've solved that problem as well. Although I'm, I'm still a little iffy on the on the trumpet. Sorry, I, I, I apologize for keeping keep coming back to the trumpet. Uh, but you know I sort of see it as a problem here because you've got you've got this this is really, really great right in here, A2 oboes, right? And so that has that beautiful, hard, pointy sound. So it, you know, it is sufficient to carry this passage. You're working together with a lot of winds and so on, and a few little horns in the background, which could continue on, by the way. This could be a little bit more support going forwards from your, from your horns. So you set this up, you know, one, two. So you could do the same thing, one, two, one, two in terms of the harmonic support i think that i think that would really really work and then you could you could have that continued relationship here between clarinets and horns i think that that would work really really great okay and then you know and then just leaving out the trumpet and maybe the trumpet could come in here as you know as maybe part partially rethinking some of this right in here <clears throat> and then we've got our, you know, our. This is all really nicely done. I like this. You're you're giving your, um, you're you're doing trade offs between players, and you could do the same thing here, right? If you're going to do it, if you're going to do it this way here, then you could do the same thing there, just to give the um, the player's tongue a bit of a break, right? Because there's so much intense playing, for especially for the oboes before it's nice to sort of you know have them trade off uh and you know there is there's no reason why some of the doubling couldn't stay in the same instruments like for instance this whole idea here e d f could be the seconds coming in rather than the seconds coming in like the way that you've got this set up the seconds coming in here will be very noticeable Right, it, it's even though everybody's doubling everybody else, suddenly things are fortissimo for one group, and they will really stand out, right? Rather than this subsidiary part right in here. Yeah, and then violas and and cellos working together. This is all very nice. Okay. So, and and also the way that you ease them in. So, like fortissimo. What is happening with your dynamics here in the winds, right? So are you saying fortissimo and get louder than fortissimo? Uh, what if you went diminuendo here, right? And then, and then, then, you know, came in 
and so that everybody had this uh, piano to fortissimo kind of a of an arc. <clears throat> okay, so um, that just you know leaves you know we are right on that uh, evaluation criteria uh, of driving staccato transitioning to the next passage. There is a touch of of the next section and so we can see that you are thinking about the transition and that that is very nice right so just a couple of little things uh, is i'm not sure if this is a dorico thing or a muse score thing but you know you're on your percussion line you should just have the the single line percussion have the snare sound and then just have the note heads on the on that line right see if you can get that together. And then the, the other thing that I would say is <clears throat> you've got fortissimo timpani and you know I'm wondering if there could be a little bit of consistency in the way that they're used, right? So you've got um, now you're going bum 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 pow and then you go pow, pow, pow. And then right in here, they just drop out, right? So <clears throat> what if there was another percussion instrument and the timpani were trading off with them, right? So like, so maybe this part in here could be played by bass drum or maybe this part in here could be played by bass drum and then you could have this same idea come back in with the timpani and it could be a little bit more consistent right in here. Like, you know, this just this this whole page, there are some great ideas. And, you know, especially right in here, this is just such nice scoring. Uh, it's just a matter of scope, right? The scope between the two instruments and the proportions, right? So it's like, <clears throat> you brought me this really great sculpture, you know, and I can see the lines and I, I can see the shape and the color of the marble and everything else. So the decisions that you're making are, are pretty good. It's just there's some parts that you haven't quite chiseled down and polished and so on yet, right? So I would say, you know, good sculpture. <clears throat> really enjoying looking at it. And it's a really strong start to this this collection of, uh, of scores. So thank you again for, you know, for being a website subscriber and, you know, and, and just, you know, one little thing that I would like to say right here at the beginning of the video instead of at the end where it might not be heard and that is that I really do appreciate how Roque and a lot of other people uh, in these um, website evaluations have been going on to YouTube <coughs> perhaps on Facebook and giving feedback to those um, those scores that have been uploaded you know in my own evaluations and then also some people have left their own efforts um, getting a little bit of early feedback before they send them to me or or maybe even just having already sent them to me but saying look you know Thomas is probably not going to get to this for about a month so here it is what do you think so Roque has been active in that and a lot of other people have been making comments and so on so I really appreciate all of that and please keep them coming Right, we're going to be heading into what I've found uh, as lean times. Like things always start off at the beginning of these evaluations with lots of people making comments, and you know, in order to get through 160 scores, 165 scores this time, um, I, I have to turn them out at a very fast rate, uh, and it's really a, a huge amount of work on this end. But I really love doing it. Um, but the thing that keeps me going is those comments. So it gets kind of harder and harder on me going towards the, the middle and the end when the comments fall off. Now, so far that hasn't happened. So could this be the uh, the challenge in which the the amount of comments uh, balances with the amount of effort on this side? That would be really really great. I I appreciate it so much. All the you know and 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 they've all been supportive. Right. There have been, I mean, I think almost no comments where somebody said, well, you shouldn't have done that, right? Which is, is like the wrong thing to say. It's like, what is, we're all about building with orchestration online, not tearing down, right? So <clears throat> anyway, so thank you. This is a great first score. Now on to the next one.
And now for Danielle's score. So this is really, really fun. I love all the ideas in this and just like the, you know, I, I love the, the fact that it sounds full, even though you're using kind of a chamber music approach, really holding off on your brass and your timpani and so on. And there's, there's very little in the way of percussion. And that actually gives your harp a chance to come through. However, okay. <clears throat> harp is feasible if everything else was much softer at the beginning, right? So if you were to drop this down to, say, um, like Forte, and you had big rolls here, <clears throat> like a big, a big harp roll on this chord at Fortissimo accent for your harp, you would get some harp coming through here. And then if you drop this part right in here down to mezzo forte as a sort of a contrast to the beginning, and you keep your harp going at fortissimo, then you will also be able to hear this, right? However, the, um, the fact that you are scoring fortissimo, and this is forte, that means that nobody will really hear the harp. You can hear it a little bit on this mock-up, but that's just because it's a mock-up, right? It's deceptive. <clears throat> also, you'd have to pull back on the pizzicato a little bit. Uh, not, not, not hugely, but uh, some of these pitches, I mean, they do work together. Um, it would just have to be softer, right? So once again, mezzo forte, in the in the lower strings and then uh, continuing on fortissimo in the harp <clears throat> and then your harp part would have a chance of coming through uh, sur surely there's a way of simplifying this right that that's just much more readable okay so um <clears throat> There's another problem that, but we'll we'll deal with we'll deal with it in the um, evaluation criteria because I'm finding that it's just a really useful tool to apply the same concerns that I had to the scores that I'm getting. I think that it's just a, a really fair way of of um, evaluating everyone's scores, including my own. So <clears throat> we have the concern of pitch weight in the upper middle register, that's not such a big deal because you are spreading out the sound picture. The scope gets larger in these sections, so that's fine. The thematic material getting, you know, feeling repetitive, uh, you know, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it, it's, maybe it is repetitive the way that you've scored it, but it's a very interesting repetition, right? So it, in, and it's also, um, I think that the that the harder that you push at something, the um, you know the 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 more screaming <laughs> the opening is, then the more repetitive it feels when you copy paste it, right? Now there are some things here that are not necessary. Like if you just want a single clarinet and a single oboe here. Uh, stacked alongside the piccolo, which, by the way, the piccolo here is, it will just be kind of inaudible. It cannot, you know, in this register, it cannot really <clears throat> stand up to the oboe. If you want the sound of a flute in here, then you should give it to one of your flute players, and then you'll get a really nice mixture um, of, of uh, flute in its high register alongside oboe and then clarinet. That is actually a very nice little balance. So <clears throat> it's not just that, though, but it's also that this, you know, if, if there's going to be thematic work done in a major part of this piece, it should be done by the first oboe player, right? So just give that to the first oboe player all the way through. You don't, don't change over to the second just to give the second something to do. They're there as a support player. They're there to support 
the um, the first. So there's there's really no need for it to just throw them little bits and pieces. It just makes everything confusing. It's much there's much more continuity. Um, it's a stronger part if the first player gets both of these, right? Okay. <clears throat> so, like I said before, it's uh, you know it's a it's really nicely done. It's kind of like a it's almost like a chamber score in its in the way that you've written it down, but it's it's uh, it has a bigger sound. Now here, like. We have the same whole, the same question of a tied grace note, that you know, you know, so like the same note starting before the beat, beat which is not the same concern as a different note starting before the beat, right? But um, is different than da, right? So where is the downbeat? That's the that is going to be the question for anybody who's playing along on this B. So say the first flute player and your piccolo player. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, so that sort of deals with the um, with the first concern. Now, melodic development from here. I really like the way that you throw in some bass clarinet in here, played in its shallow register. That's very cool, right under your first violins, and then you have the other instruments come in. I would just point something out, and that is that that a single bass clarinet is going to be answered by five wind players playing together. So the, it, you, you make it work. I mean, it sounds all right in the mock-up, and that is because you've got your, uh, your first violinist continuing on, and that sort of keeps everything together. But there will be just a lot more weight all of a sudden on, the, uh, on, the, uh, you know, on this lower line right in here. And then, and then of course, you know, the, the thing to remember is that it will also jump, right? So this is sounding down a, uh, a major ninth and then we'll jump up the octave plus the octave that is going to be doubling with the uh, first violins. So because the first violin line stays consistent it's not such a shocker right but it's just something to watch out for right and and all of course all the weight that is down here um, on on these um, winds all playing together, and then just this little piccolo playing along with the violins on top, right? It's not very well balanced. Now here you're going all the way up to a high D with your first violins, right? And and I mean it's playable. It's a kind of shrieky up there, but it is playable. So I'm just kind of wondering if you are going all the way up to D here, then why do you pull back here and just drop? Right, because we can hear that drop. The you know, both sets of violins are dropping down a seventh, and then it's exactly at the same time that the brass are coming in, and we've got this low tuba coming from the bottom. So we just really feel like the bottom is being pulled out of this line. So even though the piccolo goes farther, by the way, you, you never need this on your your piccolo. Like piccolo players don't need an ottava. All right. <clears throat> See, that's that's just way way easier to read. All right now, you could have put the uh, well. I mean, you also don't need the ottava for the violin player either. Uh, but maybe just to save some space between this staff and this staff and the full score. Okay. But I think that if you are going to assume players who are good enough to do this without sounding too squeaky, then you can also assume that they will be able to go, they'll be able to run up just one more note to E, right? And then you have the contrast of that range. See, so the piccolo by itself is just going to get swallowed by the sound of the, the massive sound of the strings underneath it. So it is better to, better to use it to double at the pitch and strengthen the first violins. So you just go all the way up to that very, very high E. Let's assume it's like this, okay, just for argument's sake. All right, so you're going all the way up to that very, very high E, and then this comes in as a contrast, right? So it isn't yep, up, 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 E, 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 E. It should be yep, up, 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 E, 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 da, 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 right? It's like because it's the idea is that the is that the phrase ends here, and then the new one starts on the second beat, right? With this, you know, this sort of kind of scrubbing sound from the accompaniment, the bum, bum, bum. Right? Okay. Um, and then the whole concern about the accompaniment figures I've talked about already with the harp and the, working together with um, 
staccato staccato bassoons and pizzicato uh, lower strings. I think that that is really you know very lovely and simple. But I'm just wondering why what happened right in here, right? You're giving all this responsibility to the harp, which cannot really be heard with so much, so much exciting stuff going on. Uh, and we've got some pizzicato right in here and, you know, in our lower strings, but no more bassoon. So what happened, right? Or you've got this bass clarinet doing nothing. Could they not have helped out with this, right? Because, you know, you, you really want a... a I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that you should have these be the same, but you do want to have a similar level of involvement between lower winds and pizzicato strings, right? So this, I would say the same thing here. Just throw in some lower winds if you possibly can to assist in this burden that you have put onto the lower strings. Yeah, yeah, and then we have this big run going up all the way to the top here. I'll put this back the way that it was just so that I have a reference of what you originally intended. Yeah. So this is going to be hugely strong right in here. And see, another thing that is causing us to feel a slump, it's not just, it's not just the, um, the first and second violins dropping a seventh. It's also the fact that the bass trombone drops a seventh here, and then the tuba comes in an octave below that, right? So, <clears throat> um, so I mean, I get what you're trying to do here, but maybe there's a way of making the, um, the rising pitches more integrated. As I recall with the score, I took out um, a lot of unused instruments. So Danielle's um, original orchestra, I think there were some trumpets in there that were, had a blank staff and so on. So there were, there were instruments that could have been used to have more continuity going through and so that we wouldn't feel so much of a drop, right? So that that's the that's the problem with having the top line drop at the same time that as you're bringing in instruments from below, right? Yeah, and then we just have this one stroke on the timpani. So I'm wondering if there were places where the timpani could have helped out with some of the um, some of the rhythm, some of the heartbeat of this piece, in you know just in creating interest. But then again, that would take away from this lovely chamber-like approach that you've got with your scoring. So. You know, just six of one, half a dozen of the other. What do you sacrifice when you go forward with that? So well, that leads us to this section right in here, the upper middle register thing. And that's not a huge concern, except that I would say one thing. Did you notice in the mock-up that your clarinets were basically burying everybody else? Well, that's because they have accent marks on them, right? So, you know, just because there are accent marks in the piano part doesn't mean that everybody has got to have accents. All the time, right? So if this, if we, if you had left off the accents <clears throat> in the clarinet part, then, um, then I think it would have balanced better. And I, and I think it's also a situation where you can drop, you know, you can your dynamics can come back down, right? Yep, up, 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 up. Then forte. And there, there's also the whole problem that everything is fortissimo throughout this, right? So you're going crescendo to fortissimo again, right? You're already fortissimo. So is there any way of like adding some variety here uh, dynamically, right? So fortissimo, bum, 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 da, 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 you know, that whole thing. And then, and then, then maybe forte, yep, up, 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 uh, yep, up, up, da, 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 and it gives the harp more of a chance to come through, right? And then the same thing coming back in, yeah, dun, dun, da, 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 and then, and then you come back to forte and then you have somewhere to come from to go to fortissimo or you could even have mezzo forte as i suggested before on these alternating parts forte mezzo forte forte mezzo forte crescendo to fortissimo and then this can be nice and big but see here's the problem once again fortissimo accents the overtones from the clarinets are going to erase what's going on here in the flutes to a two degree right so <clears throat> it's it's just it's a situation where you have to bring in more forces right you would have to double that double some of these pitches with uh with your strings like and th you wouldn't have to send the first violins all the way up to here you could have first violins on this excuse me first violins on on this pitch and then seconds maybe playing the octave below right and then you get that sort of reinforcement 
of upper partials going on. All right, and then we're heading to this. Um, and now here you're trading off every other bar, you know. And so, so I'm, I mean, I feel that this is this is fun. You know, you've got strings on top, clarinets on the bottom, and you've got molto marcato, right? So in in a dogfight like this, <laughs> between one group of strings and a couple of clarinets, the clarinets are going to win. So, you know, for an integrated sound, it would be better to have two string groups doubled by two wind groups, right? So uh, in, in a situation like this, I would actually bring down the volume of the, of the, the clarinets, bring down the dynamic, right, to forte, and then just to absolutely ensure that they were subsidiary to the violins. So, but I mean, that would still be still be nicely balanced. So, forte going forwards, and you know, you could also just bring everything down. Forte piano, and then have the strings come in here, uh, going to say mezzo piano, and then crescendo. Right, they have somewhere to come come from. Molto marcato, they could crescendo to say forte, and then ease off, and then you can start your next section like maybe mezzo forte or forte, you know, poco forte, as I think I, I wrote in parentheses in the score. Just, it's, you know, it's still a, an aggressive sound, but it isn't, uh, but it isn't just com completely committed to the same sort of fortissimo scoring that you would assume just from looking at the piano score. So yeah, I mean, wow, just gave me a lot to talk about. And, and just like, once again, I really love the, the, you know, the way that you got more out of less, right? You can hear that in the mock-up. You can, you know, you can sort of feel it in the, just looking at the page that really there's, there is a lot going on here and, it, and it's working really well. It's just the proportions, right? The, you know, if you have this kind of strength, even without the brass, you're still not going to hear the harp very well. Right, it'll, it'll come through in the mock-up, but that's a mock-up. That's not real life, right? And just watch out for things like this, a tie with an accent on both ends, right? Yeah, that's that's not a thing, right? So, yeah. Anyways, um, <clears throat> but yeah, just what a cool score. <laughs> really enjoyed this one a lot, and uh, it bodes well for what is to come. So there are a few more things I could say about the accompaniment in here. You know, the the this top. Um, G right in here of uh, the horns being very very bright right and then and, and at the same time there's your you have pizzicato in your string so it's very very weak um, you know, the force of the of the strings right in here is extremely weak compared to the brightness of this high G in the in the horns so I mean there's a lot of little things I could pick at but just in general like the whole the entire effect you know it's it's once again like the score just before it it's something that, you know, we could, you know, the, the, the general conception of it is really, really beautiful. And, but just picking away at it and chiseling things out and smoothing things over and so on. Uh, so you have a much more um, uh, comprehensible kind of a structure and things work clearly and you have balance where you need it, right? So anyway, so thank you <laughs> for this really great entry. And now on to the next one. Okay, Lauren. So that is a massive score. I mean, that there are just touches of like a safari adventure in there with this, you know, the the um, the kind of the congas. I think that that this is. So yeah, make sure if you have a percussion line like this that you you tell us what instrument you're using. All right. So I'm wondering, is this Dorico or? Yeah, I mean, it, it looks like Dorico. Also, I'm noticing with my Dorico entries that Dorico is choosing to 
to cut off the grace notes, right? So it's starting right on the beat. And, you know, instead of seeing that there is a grace note and then starting a little early. It's so one, th one thing that, that you know, I, I, uh, that's that's something that I think that, that, that people, sh you know, Dorico should just really have, have built in, you know, a couple of beats of dead, dead space before starting the score. Um, you know, uh, bef you know, rather than just starting right on the downbeat, I think that that's, you know, obviously we see, we see the, we see the problem immediately, right? Um, okay, so there's, there's kind of a sense of <clears throat> sprawl with this, you know, and, and, and that's not, that's not said in a negative way. It's just huge, you know, and with a very slow tempo like that, 120, it, you know, it, it tends to sprawl even more. So it would be interesting to hear this mock-up at like 160, right? You know, just like really driving and and more dancey, right? Rather than just very slow steps like this. Uh, I think it would still work at a faster speed, but you know, of course, getting hooked on speed like that um, is uh, can be fatal in in any sense of the phrase. So let's you know, there's a lot to talk about. Um, one little thing that really stuck in my head that I I'm going to mention right off the bat, and that is, and, and it'll come up again in the context of the accompaniment figures, is that I really felt the massive hole right in here. Right? Um, you know, you know, so if you, um, if you look at the, at the score, right, there is actually a chord as this last little bit of melody runs up to that high E. So, so, so yeah, so you, you, you kind of need to, um, like, you know, if you were to put that in, if you were to put some sort of chord in here, like just this, this accompaniment coming to the end with just this big pow right here, then I feel that it would be a smoother transition, like leaving it out we really feel it really feels like two sections that were kind of stuck together right so you've got this da 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 da, 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 da and then you know there's kind of nothing to really tie it together okay and then the, the other thing that i noticed was there it seems to be like um a snare side stick in here as well right so um, that hits every so often, and that's not in the score. So I'm wondering what happened to that. Maybe you ran out of vertical space. But like here, with the harp, you could have just left the harp set, the harp staves out, right? We, like if we're not, if you're not going to use them for your entry, just leave them out, and then you have way more vertical space. Maybe you can put in that staff with the uh, the snare stick in it, and so on. And then of course, I would say. Once again, uh, this is one of the things that that I'm I'm suspecting is a Dorico thing, and that is possibly the um you know the the fact that I'm seeing a lot of percussion lines where the notes have been dropped from the the center line, right? So just you know, you know if there's some way to just have like if you know this is going to be a conga part, just write you know, just have a conga line, right? Have a conga line. Um, it, just have a line that says conga on it and then or and then just have the then have that on that one staff and then you know then the snare line can be another one and you can just say side stick on it like you know, as a as a reminder right it would be better to do that than to have these sort of dropped lines and then also forgetting to tell me what the name of the instrument is right you know because for all i know that's wood blocks and it's just the sound set is not that great right and then where does that leave us right so make sure that we know what instrument you're using. Okay. Um, so let's get to our evaluation criteria. So obviously the first one is off the table. You know, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano, you have just gone for it and you have filled in everything. However, I do like the whole sense of contrast. Like you're keeping things in the upper middle register at the beginning here. Bium, 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 bium. And then everybody comes in, wham. Yeah, bum bum bum, and then you have a little bit of lead in here with your congas, and then same thing, pow. And uh, all right, so this happens twice. There's a lot of copy paste 
uh, in some parts and not in others, right? So, that, so I, I find that very intriguing. I mean, the parts still end up sounding very similar, but they're not really the same, right? And that, that is enough of a variance to uh, address the second part, which is thematic material repeats often possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated the exact same way twice. Well, it's not the exact same way. It feels very similar. But, you know, since you have so much weight coming in here, um, you know, in other parts, you've got more filling in uh, and you've got different emphasis, right? Like before you had this second beat emphasis every second bar and you've sort of taken that away, right? So except like, I mean, you put it in here, but you you took it away and there's, you know, that it's missing. Some of its elements are missing the second time and so on, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, um, so <coughs> some of the orchestration and the notation presents a little bit of a problem. So it's really kind of unclear what you mean here. Um, so, you know, do you mean that, uh, that this should be, do you mean that that this should be one part on each staff. So like you have to tell us who is playing what, right? Especially with horns. So is this the first and second and that is the third and fourth? Because if that's the case, it should actually be octaves in both parts, right? So with the first on top, the second on the bottom playing this part would be on the top staff. staff, And then, the, then you'd have exactly the same thing with the third and the fourth, right? That would be how I would score this, right? So if it's just two players... If you just intended this for to be two voices, then get rid of the scoring in this lower staff and just put the octave up here because that's how it should be played. The first and the second playing octaves together, which is like a lot of their role. And the same thing here. If you don't really, if you just really intended there to be, you know, to be two players, then you should have it on the top staff where, uh, you know, the first and the second could work together on this. I think it would be a better way of putting it. So it would be A2. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> so you have this other problem in here, and that is you have this screaming high C's. Okay. So it is not to say trumpets can't do this. They can do this. You know, some players can play high C's all day long and others, you know, they use up their lip for, you know, when they had more delicate stuff planned in the later piece and so on. So, you know, it just depends on how much goodwill you can um, you can get out of your trumpet players, but I feel that this is a mistake. One and two on top, three on the bottom. It should be the the other way around, right? Like the higher the note is on trumpet, the less it needs to be doubled, right? And like the sort of lower and middle notes, when they double together uh, in a situation like this, then they add their overtones to the high note. And then you get a much fuller effect. But the way that you got it here, there's a much, much bigger risk of the second player cracking, right? Like the, you know, like you would assume that the first player has has got the the strongest chops, right? So one of the players is possibly going to crack on one of these notes. It could be the first, and then you know, but the high cracking of both players is is a definite risk, right? So it would be better to have one player on top and two in the middle. Or two on the bottom. And then you know, there's also the situation of how does that balance with the rest of the orchestra? You know, you got this bam, 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 and then yet that, that, that. So is anybody going to be able to hear the flutes and, and oboes in here, right? Will the sound of the trumpets absorb the sound of the piccolo above? Well, I mean, you can throw in everybody just like before, you know, just like you've scored it here, I should say, and and it will still come through to a degree. I mean, I like the fact that you fatten things up with the uh, with the horns here and so on. That's kind of cool. So yeah, so um, I think I, I think in the next <clears throat> in the next round of evaluations, the next um, the next evaluations next year, I think I, I will have to have basically just you know, have people say whether or not their score is in C or transposed, right? So I prefer transposed. So if there's a little button in Dorico that you could, you know, or if there's a little command that you can give to your score that turns everything into transposed parts, that's what I would prefer, right? 
rather than reading in C. And I know that sounds crazy. It's like, well, it's in C. I mean, you should know what it looks like. But, you know, it, you just, you know what things are better when you are used to looking at transposed scores all day long, right? And you also see what the players are seeing. There's a lot to it, but, yeah. So, all right, so that takes care of, of our kind of our two sort of mirror sections. Then then we've got this next next thing, and like usually I start with the melodic development, right? But I'm going to start with the accompaniment figures, right? So accompaniment figures cover a wide range of pitches and wind registers, right? So, uh, you know, some of this, like immediately you see the problem here with the flutes, because like the, you know, for both piccolo and standard flute, the written E is very weak, right? And then the B is not all that strong either. So you start to get more strength up here, E and B on top, right? And so like if you're having like oboes play, it really would be better to have clarinets and oboes play and just leave the flute out, maybe have piccolo coming in on top with a couple of little notes. That would be a much stronger way, but like the flutes have got really no chance right in here. You can mark them fortissimo all you like, but you know, just like forte oboes will just just you know bury the those low E's and mo and most of the B's. So, um, you know, bassoon, contra bassoon. It is so much. It is such a powerful interpretation, a transcription of the accompaniment figures. And I'm not saying that that's wrong at all. I think that it's exciting. <laughs> I think it's really thrilling. And I love the way that you threw in your trombones uh, right in here. That's so powerful. The problem is, what's going on with the melody, right? So that's why I'm coming coming around to the melody through the back door. The melody is just not very strong compared to the accompaniment. The accompaniment is so ferocious, so huge, right? There, There is very little chance Right? It, could you have thrown in maybe like a, a trumpet line on this, you know, doubling this right in here, or maybe um, <clears throat> saying that you went along with my uh, my little idea of giving this line to the flutes? Excuse me, this line right here uh, of the flutes doubling the oboes. Give that to the clarinets. Then you've got some flutes that can thicken up these lines right in here. You know, English horn could be playing along with the second violins, right? So you you have you have some options here, but if you're going to make the accompaniment this powerful, you really have to think about the um, the consistency of the melody, which is really at a loss here. You can hear it in the in the mock-up, and it will be just as true in real life. That that you know the the accompaniment will basically just take over. Uh, this is cool, though, in the timpani. I like that scoring. That's kind of fun, you know. And then everything that's going on here in the middle strings, uh, lower strings, that's all very fun. Uh, see, and then here, you like, you're coming in, and your winds, and, you know, they're all kind of playing the melody, and then suddenly there's, like, no more accompaniment. Like, what happened? The accompaniment, if you look at the uh, score, the accompaniment keeps going, right? So I would say... Like yeah, you know, the only instruments that are doing that here are your your uh, middle strings. So keep going, accompaniment in other instruments. See if you if you if this is being played by clarinets, then the clarinets are available to double what's going on in the violas, right? And the bassoons, you know, why are they doing nothing when the cellos are doing this fun stuff here? And then, you know, you could have your um, you could have one bassoon playing this, and then you could have your contra and your second bassoon covering some of these lines. Like not the, I would, I wouldn't give it the whole thing to the contra bassoon. I would have like the contra bassoon coming in right here around this A. So have the, um, have the second bassoon play this, and then the contra come in right here, and then it can dive down to this E, and then stop. Right. So I, I just think that leaving this bear right in here is, you, you know, is possibly just interrupts the momentum. All right, and then, you know, <clears throat> speaking of which, to, to continue contrasting the melodic development and the accompaniment figures. Okay, I already, I already said what I was going to say about finishing the accompaniment figure the way that it is in the piano score, just being very, very important, right? Uh, <clears throat> but this is a little strange. Dun, 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 what happened? to the doubling. 
It's really needed in here. Like, you, you know, your instincts, you know, like, da 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 right? You, it, it carries forward from here, right? It take, picking up with the strings, you need to keep doubling those strings right in here. You cannot just leave a gap like this. You do not need ottava here. But this is strange how you jump down to the lower E. So this lower E is the same pitch as this written E. And then you've got the A right in there um, being played by the first, uh, first flute. Okay. And yeah. All right, so so look, it the piccolo can easily play that high E, right? It just right, you know, the way you've got it now is ya ba 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 ba, like on the top line. So I think that it's perfectly fine for the violins to drop, but I think that the piccolo should just continue on up to that E, and and you do not need ottava for either of these instruments, right? So check out um, my video on. Um, Atava do's and don'ts. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just like uh, uh, wind players do not need Atava, uh, neither do string players, unless like there's a lot of fiddly stuff on the very top octave of the piano that is going on for pages and pages, right? Uh, and then I would say, yeah, okay. Um, and, and, you know, like some theater parts, you'll see a lot of Atava in your, you know, in very, very high wind and, and violin scoring, but, you know, like that doesn't mean that the players like it, right? They can read, they can read it without the ottava, right? Some people, I'm sure, people are going to comment below and say, "Well, I have no problem with ottava, and I'm a, you know, I'm a, I play for, you know, Boston Symphony Orchestra as the first flute player." Okay, well, that's great for you, all right. But most flute players that I have ever talked to and discussed this with are telling me they don't want to see ottava. Uh, and, you know, same with violinists. I remember a very long conversation I had <laughs> with a concert, with a um, a freelance concert master. So, like, whenever a show came to, um, like, a, a big show like Les Mis or something like that came to San Francisco, the Bay Area, he would get hired to be the concert master. And that he just hated Ottawa because he, he would show up in those theatrical parts, right? So not, not as big of a concern with concert music. All right, I'll shut up about it now. So uh, I like the way that this drops off and we go into our next concern um, of the upper middle register stuff. That's not a concern, like the, you know, the, the, rel the relentlessness of it is not a, as big a concern. We've got the ba 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 yeah da, da 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 I really like the way that you know the you allow the phrase that came before this massive massive phrase to just end on that first beat. And you know I'm not going to go into huge detail about how you harmonize everything. That's all fine. Um. Yeah, and then we got the yep ba 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 da 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 da. Okay, yeah, it's I mean it's all working fine. And you know just really big thick. Uh, full wind and brass scoring right in here. And I really, I like the way that you go to this, you know, the um, upper brass. Continuing on in, um, alongside the winds and so on and so forth. That's all really nicely done. Um, once again, I would say, you know, do, does everything need to be accented the way it was and phrased the way that it was in the piano score? I don't think it needs to be, right? Um, and then this is really kind of strange the way you got you got an accent at the beginning, slur, and then an accented staccato at the end. So, bah. yeah, I mean, it, it works. There's like nothing really wrong with it, but like like right in here, da da da. I mean, for a trombone part, that's really, you know, I feel like you could just get rid of the slur here for both of these trombone parts. Um, you know, tuba's all right, but I mean, it's kind of really not needed. Yeah, I mean, uh, it'll it'll work fine in your bassoons in your lower strings. That's that's all. That's on, the only place where you really need that. I see what you're doing here. You want a, a sense of smoothness going, you know, leading into the beginning of this little phrase here. Yep, yeah, up, 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 up. Um, so, but I mean, I think it's overdone with your lower brass right in here. This is really cool um, trumpet scoring all through here. And then once again, you know, 
just it's really just better practice to have um to have like the the first and second on the bottom and the th excuse me the first the second and third on the bottom and the first on top um you know you know normally uh, like if, if everything were going to stay in this register right in here then you could say oh yeah okay first and second on top third on the bottom that's fine but the thing is you keep going up to a and then you know you've got this you know bump 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 i just feel that it's just safer to score it a little differently <clears throat> but you know you've got your trombone doubling right in here and you know i mean this sort of works but then like right in here i would really want like as the as the trombone part drops down and the trumpets leap i would really want the second and third to be on this rather than both on top right it just really is overbalanced and you know i mean who's going to hear the strings with all this going on right with so much wind and brass power and especially like with the the way you know the way that the uh trumpets just push their way through any texture when they are asked to go above the staff but i mean you know maintaining a driving staccato <laughs> yes transitioning to the next passage you know uh, i don't know what you planned for the next passage but it probably would have been something just as massive as right in here so that just, you know, brings up one last little question, and that is overall scope, right? Like, you know, when, <clears throat> you know, there's something about these orchestration challenges that is a little ambiguous, right? So like the, you know, the whole point of it is to send me something that is orchestrated and get some feedback. But, you know, what is the, you know, when, when the, when, and, and usually it's just the first page for website evaluations, but like, when people have to submit the entire thing, right, they start thinking more holistically. So, you know, even just on this first screen here, you know, here you've really used, like, um, the orchestra as a way of balancing itself, right? So, like, with more parts and less parts and higher parts and lower parts as a way of getting some kind of variation of dynamic and so on, right? But, I mean... Doesn't this suggest crescendo to fortissimo that you have to come from somewhere, right? So, so maybe if that's so, then maybe these parts, this part right in here, should have been forte, and then you could push from the forte to the fortissimo. And if this part is forte rather than fortissimo, maybe this part should be forte rather than fortissimo, right? So, and then softer, pushing into fortissimo again, right? And then the same thing happening there. <clears throat> okay, so, I mean, I mean, it's just a colossal score, right? It's so much fun. Um, you know, once again, just like the... You know the the whole idea of the accents on the bump bah bump bah right. If you've got all of this, you know the way that this is set up, the the lower brass are really just sitting heavy on this. Um, and you know you left out the accent on your tuba, and that that was pretty smart. I would say leave it out of your trombones as well, and then you can leave it in your strings. And I would say you know like. You you can put you can put the lower strings in there if you like just to add some smoothness to this, but you don't have to, right? I mean, the way that you left them out is perfectly fine. So so yeah, I mean, just such a fun score. I mean, you, you know, everybody is giving me something very different this year, and you know, I just it's 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 rare when I see two scores that are very very similar. Of course, like this is only the 19th score of these website evaluations that I have taken a look at. So, uh, and I've got 94 to get through, <laughs> but that's all right. I really, really enjoy these just tre tremendously. It's just so much fun. So, um, speaking of which, uh, let the fun continue with the next entry.
All right, Hervé, what an exotic sounding score. Uh, it's just very um, sort of perfumed and Mediterranean and uh, yeah, the, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of really fun stuff in here. <clears throat> so uh, just a few notes about scoring. Uh, usually like one and then um, close parentheses is not the exact way to <clears throat> to mark the difference between uh, the difference between different players. It's it's better to go one period. I think is just a much more standard way of doing it. I really appreciate that you've worked out, you know, a two wins and or one or or the other and so on. So let's. <clears throat> talk about a few other things before I jump into the uh, the evaluation criteria. And, <clears throat> excuse me, one of those things is the, um, the combined staff here. I, I would really, really prefer separate staves. It's just so much clearer, you know. Um, <clears throat> like here you're saying which one is which, you know, B5, C4, G5, and so on. You know, if there just was like, you know, high and low wood block on two lines, right, so that would be a wood block, wood block player, then there was a castanet line, and so on, a symbol line. I think that you've got enough room to add all those on separate lines. It just works out so much better. <clears throat> there is some strange scoring in here, which makes me wonder whether or not some of this was composed on a DAW and then um, and then imported into, I'm guessing, uh, Dorico. And, yeah, and, and, and then... <sighs> There's kind of a, there's a strange sort of um, difference here. Okay, so, um, I'm, yeah, so just looking at this, you've got two accented grace notes and then, uh, and then an accent, accented principal note. So basically you're asking them to go da-da-da, right? Um, and then the same thing here. So, so that is actually something that I would probably score more like this, like actually notate out the, um, the, the precise rhythm. And then this right in here, boom, 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 I would write in as grace notes. So it's, I, I would kind of do the reverse of what you're doing here. Yeah, so I would just say, you know, try to clean some of these things up next time. Like, you know, if you have very strange ties and other things like this. If you have violas being scored very, very high, you should just go to treble clef, right? Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, one last thing, and that is, I, I'm noticed. This is the second score I've noticed so far in this group of uh, um, the um, the first wind player getting um, getting a bit of uh, of melody, and then the second wind player getting a bit of melody. Really, just in cases like this, give it all to the first. Right, that is their job. If you have just one person playing and it is a critical melodic part, then then it should be given to the first, unless. You know, there really is a tiring part that goes on and on, and you want to trade off between the two players. There's no reason why the second couldn't also play this, but that's not the second's role. The second's role is uh, support, <clears throat> doubling, and so on, right? So, uh, yeah, so, so so don't worry. You're not insulting anybody by giving the this to the first, right? That The second player's feelings will not be hurt, all right? And, yeah, so, so once again, here's, like, some strange some strange scoring that makes me wonder whether or not this was, um, yeah, and then just right after the beat by a uh, 30 second rest makes me wonder if this were, um, imported from, uh, a DAW 
um, these tracks were to some degree, or some of them were, or some of them were perhaps played in instead in um, <clears throat> in a, like recorded. So yeah, so try to clean some of these you know strange rhythms up. You know, if things should be a dotted rhythm, then make them a dotted rhythm. <clears throat> okay, so in the case that you did not intend this to be uh, to be dotted, that you really did work this out and you wanted this to come in like just, you know, a slight, slightly late, you know, just a 16th rest late and a 32nd rest late and so on and so forth. You're going at a fairly slow speed, 120, compared to the uh, 160 that <clears throat> that I recommended for this score. So, I mean, some of these things are possible, but it's just, it, it's sort of, you know, everybody kind of, or a lot of people playing kind of off the beat, kind of late, uh, especially when pizzicato is involved. It, it's, it, it, you know, it's just make, it overcomplicates things, right? It, it makes things harder than they need to be. Like, for instance, here, um, there's no reason why this couldn't just be two eighth notes, right? And then these could also be two eighth notes. And it just was so much easier to read, right? There's there's no need for them to be to be sixteenth notes if they're if they're basically playing staccato, right? So just you know make it all staccato eighth notes, and it's you know just like this, and it's just so much easier to read. So <clears throat> those are a few notes, you know. Then just you know like if you are going to have high B in your bassoon a lot, then this should be tenor clef and so on. But I mean, I appreciate that you have transposed parts. That's very helpful. <clears throat> All right, so now let's go to our evaluation criteria. Uh, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the, or of the piano, how does that translate to orchestra? It's not a big issue. However, you know, every once in a while I'm thinking, well, why couldn't like one part, like a couple of bars or four bars, be in the upper middle register and then the following one could be stretched out, expanded in scope, and so on and so forth. You know, there could be some back and forth just to, you know, so everything isn't so grounded um, with so much weight on the bass, right? Now, you actually don't do that too much. I mean, you know, your double bass part is, is pretty nimble and it, you know, not really until here do you really sort of hit notes very heavily and you know and we there's a little bit of timpani in both places but it's not you know it's not so big of an issue there's some missing dynamics here and there right um there's some kind of unbalanced dynamics you have <clears throat> fortissimo in your upper winds fortissimo in your lower strings and harp and then mezzo forte in your lower winds, right? So th these will be very hard to hear in in practical terms. Sorry, my cat is making noise in the background. Actually, my son's cat uh, is is having fun with the uh, with the scratcher. So <clears throat> so yeah. So just to to get back to the criteria. Um, the thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive. And what's cool about this is that you really do move, you do change things around, right? So your first four bars are different from bars uh, nine through twelve, right? So that's that's really great. That's you know you you do change things. They they kind of sound similar though. Like the the treatment of them is is very similar in practical terms. But yeah, but once again, very difficult to read this kind of stuff. Um, it would be better like like this should be like a grace note going to this high G sharp, right? And and of course this should be in tenor clef, like all of this really high scoring, and this should be in treble clef, as I said before. <clears throat> so so you do address that whole question of of the thematic material. You know, avoiding it being repetitive. Okay, so let's move on to the next criteria: the melodic development soaring quite high, the accompaniment figures covering a wide range. I think you you solved that. I mean, there's 
this should, yeah, this should be in Trouble Clef, but it's totally, totally playable. But this really is more of a second violin part, really. And this is more of a, of a viola part from around here, right? So it's just, it's just more in the range of those instruments. Like you're really driving your cellos high um, to a place where their string length is, is fairly short. And the same thing with the violas. You're driving the violas very high to where their string length is kind of short. So, like, it's just better to, if you're doing, you know, lots of pizzicato and staccato and so on and so forth, <clears throat> it's better to have the, um, the placement, you know, the registers of the instruments more, uh, more in their, or the, the choice of instruments more in their home registers, I would say. Just so you, you get a bigger, bitter, excuse me, bigger resonance, uh, richer sound. <clears throat> so, getting back to that melody, you know, the accompaniment figures, though, are, are kind of fun. This is just kind of strange, the way this is, is treated. The, the, um, the melody just seems to get lower every time, rather than soaring upwards, right? So, bum, bum, bum. And it's just, and it's, there's a lot of change, just, you know, um, yeah, you, you know, it's, it's okay to hold, right? So like, if you've got this hold right in here, ba -ba 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 -ba, da -da 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 -da, it, it's better for the piccolo to hold rather than just, just to completely let go. You're sending your oboe player up, you know, pretty high there, like up to F and it's a, it's a better note. I mean, it, it's it's perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with going up to F there for the oboe player, but it's just, you know, it's, it's not it's it's not its strongest kind of register. It's more um, it's kind of a more shallow note, right? It's like if you really want that beautiful blended reed sound and a lot stronger and more secure, it is really better to send the clarinet player up there, right, as a as a par partner to your first flute, landing on this sounding F. And then <clears throat> here, like the, you know, the piccolo has this beautiful radiance above, and then all of a sudden it's an octave lower, right? So I just don't understand the rationale there. Da -da 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 -da. Bum, 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 right? It's, it's just, just sort of strangely put together. Then, you know, of course, like really, you know, low bass clarinet, this is, uh, this is, the second B below middle C, so like an an octave and a and a, <clears throat> an octave and a second, an octave and a major second um, below uh, below this written C sharp. Yeah, and then you know, so you're just sort of setting up your octaves. Um, you know, the bottom here in our uh, our bass bass clarinet and. You know, then we've got the clarinet on top of that. Uh, so are these two clarinets? Is one clarinet? And like you were very careful about it up here, but is this a two clarinets? One is this a single clarinet? So here we have oboes one and two. So I guess it's a, just a single clarinet. Okay, <clears throat> and then um, yeah, a two doubling. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's going to have a very kind of a bright. Uh, kind of almost a liquid color, the way that you have scored this out right in here. But there is going to be a feeling of dropping off. You know, you're pushing in here with your French horns, and it doesn't really show up in the mock-up, but it will definitely be audible in, in real life. And, you know, there's this sudden flush of warmth right in here with our, um, with our horns, and then just a sudden, sudden empty spot, right? nothing, right? So I'm, I'm noticing this a lot, just in general. <clears throat> there will be like, you know, just a bar of accompaniment of accompaniment or doubling or support, and then an empty bar afterwards. And I'm not sure if that is because people are rushing things, maybe not thinking everything through, or maybe kind of just going for like a, an effect where like, aha, so we have this and then suddenly it's gone. Well, the suddenness of its departure will definitely be something that the audience listens to and may actually feel is a, is a problem, right? Just like you know, what happened to those horns? Like they were, they were there. They were. Um, another cat is chewing on my orchestration books. I think she's trying to tell me something. That's okay. She can, she can wait. <clears throat> All right. So let's jump to this second part. Uh, 
So it's really going to this whole pizzicato melody idea. <clears throat> and I feel, <clears throat> excuse me, and I feel it's slightly problematic because, you know, we had all that wonderful wind doubling before, and this is almost like a pale shadow, you know. Um, you know, I mean, I really lo love the horns backing up this pizzicato, but, you know, I, I feel if you're going to put this much horn into something, um, and, you know, and this, and, you know, along with the trumpets, <clears throat> then you really should be giving it all the pizzicato you possibly can. You know, why are the violas absent here? Right? And and also, it, you know, there's there's the concern uh, with B-flat trumpets, <clears throat> you're going all the way up to this high-sounding D, uh, written E. So, like, you know, unless you're working with somebody who's kind of got a jazz lip, that's not really a concert uh, trumpet note. I mean, yeah, yeah, there are concert trumpet players who can go up to G. <clears throat> but that's not really a standard thing, you know. Um, so what, what you have to remember is something that I've, I've discussed before. Um, and, and that is that, that trumpets have the suggestion of sounding an octave higher built right into them. So there's no need to send the trumpet player all the way up to E. You will feel the force of the trumpet player sounding higher and shriller, just even going up to this E here, right? You could what you could have done is you could have going uh yeah, blah, 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 and then just here jump to the lower G, doubling this the um <clears throat> uh, excuse my uh throat clearing. Uh doubling what's going on here in um it's actually sounding F, uh, doubling what's going on in the uh, the middle pizzicato part, right? So, okay, so <clears throat> I have not mentioned the harp yet. The harp really is invisible the way that it is scored before. Okay, and then right here, um, it just does not have a chance. Like, if you were to have the harpist play like two octaves higher in octaves, then you would hear the harp very very clearly <clears throat> but the way this is scored i just kind of can't tell you're trying to balance things which is great you know forte brass against fortissimo strings and <clears throat> that's very commendable but we don't know where the brass are coming from right are they starting at piano or are they starting at pianissimo right so just some some more of this needs to be worked out. Mezzo forte is that mezzo forte right down here in the strings. So yeah, all right <clears throat> then. So this is there's a problem here, and that is that we have the E octaves, right? Um, but there's you know in in the music E is on top, right? So so this is harmonizing and getting lower from the top E. All right, so we don't have that top E, we have the ba ba bum on top, and so it really changes the context of the harmony and the and everybody's functions, right? And and I don't feel that it is I don't think I don't feel that in the way that you've scored this, that you've justified that change. Especially when you come in here, blah 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 blah. So there's no E to carry forward from this E to this F, right? So we don't have the E E E da 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 dum. We have this e ba 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 da 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 dum. I just feel it doesn't quite have as much continuity, right? Because like once you've established that high e, you climb down from it and climb down from the next one and so on, right? So we have this little kind of daisy chain, right? And if we take away the top e at the beginning, then um, you know we're losing something. I feel. Yeah, and then once again some more strange. Um, notation. So yeah, just just really, you know, if, if you are, um, if you're playing things in live, or if you are uh, importing from a DAW, just make sure that you clean up some of your um, your notation, and and also just you know use use grace notes rather than this kind of notation. In this, I mean, it in in you know to all intents and purposes, it's the same basic thing, right? I mean, uh, not quite. I mean, there's a difference between it. 
uh, an achacatura and an appoggiatura, right? So, so you know whether you're coming in just a little bit before the beat and hitting right on the beat or um, on the you know, so so that's that's you know I can see, but like you know you could have written it in as an appoggiatura if you just really wanted that, and it would make it much more simple. Alrighty, so <clears throat> so continuing on once again, pretty high on your violas. This could all be scored in treble clef. The the violas, oops, excuse me, sorry, tenor clef. The cellist doesn't mind. That's fine. Maybe maybe tenor clef up to here, and also treble clef going on there. And you can go back to uh, alto clef here, and then. This could stay bass clef, and then, yeah, then kind of going on from here, like throw in some tenor clef. It's not just a matter of, it's not just a matter of like losing the ledger lines. It's more a matter of like psychology, right? A, like a ledger lines like this is basically saying like this is, you know, it's it's not really inhabiting the tenor register and the tenor clef. There's a, just a, there's a kind of a thing. And it's also just easier to work out fingerings. So, yeah, um, and then, you know, our driving staccato towards the end. I don't think there's really a need for this kind of really, really abrupt. I think that, you know, I, I think the staccato and marcato is enough to get, you know, very abrupt. I mean, you can even just say secco. You don't need to add all of these 16th note rests. Maybe you get a different sound from the, um, from the mock-up. But yeah, but I mean, it's all fun. It's it's great. It just, you know, there's just a certain upper limit uh, to the trumpet scoring and so on. But I mean, yeah, but it's just like I said before, here I picked it apart, but I really enjoyed it. And I thought it, it had a really cool sound. And, you know, it's, it's one of a number of fairly slow entries that I have evaluated recently. Um, and I'm kind of wondering... In a lot of the cases of these slower entries, whether or not the people who worked on the scores actually really listened to the original track, or did they just... I'm, I'm just wondering if most people who scored things much, much slower uh, actually just went to the IMSLP page and downloaded the score and played it on the piano and then played, you know, then scored to that particular, you know, using maybe using my template, but still like slowing things down and, and kind of more interpreting things along their own interpretation as, you know, as a pianist. I'm just sort of kind of curious because I'm just seeing a lot of slower scores. So anyhow, um, yeah, but just really enjoyed the heck out of this. So on to the next score. All right, Tony, that's a hell of a section A. That's really, really fun. So, so I, I really love the, the sound that you're cultivating. Like you have a, a very clear idea in your head of, of the kind of sound that you want, right? And you, and you are building it in, in a very deliberate way. So, you know, how does that match up with the evaluation criteria? Well, um, you know, we there is there is a sort of very slow development downwards, uh, which kind of you know it, it just goes a little bit outside of where the uh, piano scoring is, and that's that's a good thing. I feel it's just you know just adding a little bit of scope. Um, on on the on the other hand, you know it 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 does make everything very trebly all the way through, right? It's just, it, it has a much higher sound. And so, so that kind of, that addresses our first criteria. Uh, the, the pitches, 
you know, pitch weight being in the upper middle register. So you really kind of do play by those rules, kind of stay there and so on. So the question of thematic material, repeating, possibly sounding repetitive, um, you know, there, you do add the scope a little bit, but I, I feel it's something that you could in, you could possibly expand on. Just, you know, the you have a little bit of a change here in your um, in your violas, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. Um, so so I feel like, you know, you could make the second, you know, instead of a direct copy paste with a little change, you could make it a bit bigger, right? Um, now, now let's talk about those orchestrated sections a little bit, okay? So you've got ah two oboes, okay? And like whenever you do that with the oboe, you end up with a more trumpet-like sound than a than a like a, a beautiful melodious woodwind sound. Like whenever you like the the oboe players obviously cannot have as much uh, expressive freedom when they are bonded together like this. So they they tend to to, to sort of rein it in and match each other's sound as perfectly as they can and that you know of course which without doing that that you know if they don't do that then then there are so so many defects that like that crop up so um so it's going to be a very hard-edged sound I, I really wish that when somebody wrote a2 on a part that the you know that note performer or whatever sound set whatever was being used on notation playback would just give you that harder sound or like with flutes you'd have that phased sound right or same thing with clarinets especially shalomo clarinets you get a phased sound so all right um so it's what's interesting about this is when does the harp work and why does it work right so so like here the harp works beautifully these this roll and you could have way bigger rolls and you could um way bigger arpeggiation and it would really like help to inhabit this but you know what what can you really not hear in the in the um the mock-up or you know just like in my own inner ear knowing how this will be realized by a real orchestra this will just not come through it's just not strong enough. If you have xylophone and glockenspiel and oboes and pizzicato on the same note at fortissimo, the harp just has zero chance of, of making this sound good. However, a big rolled chord, right? Just so long as the texture is very sparse around it, you get a beautifully present sounding har uh, harp. And then right in here, like the harpist does not really have much of a chance going forward. And, I, and I'm curious why, you know, once again, so this is this is something that I mentioned before, I'm noticing in a lot of these entries is that you'll just have, you know, you'll have a group of players setting up a really nice accompaniment or supporting uh, part and so on, and then just suddenly there'd be blank in the next two, like, which to me just kind of feels like there's no reason for that. Why couldn't... You know this bar is identical in harp and you know like so and, and here the music is getting stronger so why is the support getting weaker right now the the harpist certainly does not get any louder right the harp is is not a very loud instrument to begin with which is one of the reasons why this is almost wasted right uh so so you know why is why is there no more support right, right when everybody you know right when it would have been really really crucial and really helpful um, and then we have kind of the same thing happening here. Like we have the accompaniment stripped down to just the harp and you can sort of hear it. And that's just because of the mock-up, but we've got, you know, no, no critical support from the strings any longer. Right. So it just really becomes all about the melody. Now, um, so, so that's my, you know, that's my comment on, on the, on the support, but like as as far as the soaring melody is is concerned, we have like this a similar problem to an entry that I talked about earlier, and you probably have already started thinking about. Oh no, I did that too, right? 
So it's the same thing here. You know, you've got ah two trumpets. You know, ba 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 bum. Now you could put an accent on this, and you can diminuendo to pianist to piano all you'd like, and it's still not going to have the same force in all of these other parts put together. Xylophone, piccolo, ah two flutes, and then clarinets coming in to double for just a, a second. I don't know why they die off or. You know, I mean, once again, we're kind of missing the rest of it, right? So, um, yeah, so so it's there will definitely be a feeling of loss of of strength, right? After this, and then the same thing happening here. Ba -ba -bum. It just it doesn't quite follow through. See, look, you can just stop here with your trumpets, right, and then have. The other instruments come in, right? Or you can trade off from one instrument to the other, but maybe not something that, like if you're going to trade off from trumpets, have it be something that is just as powerful as them or as, you know, as penetrating. So, you know, what could possibly match trumpets at this force would be probably like oboes, uh, ah two oboes and clarinets put together, right? plus some strings, right? So that would have the same kind of force as two trumpets going into the upper range, right? Just that real heavy sound. So yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to have like a call and response. And and that's very cool. It, it, it would be great, except for the fact that it's that the call is so powerful, right? That, you know, even coming in fortissimo with these other, um, these other instruments, there doesn't seem to be a follow through uh, in terms of of energy. So in you know in here it's somewhat alleviated because you've got piccolo as well, right? But I mean, why couldn't, you know, one way around it is to have other instruments coming in too, but then you have the feeling of dropping out. So it, it, it is a it's just really is a problem. And then of course um trumpet and piccolo against harp. You know, even though these are just two lines, you'll hear a little bit of harp, but it will still not you know, is this just just there's just not enough going on here to really support in the way that the piano score, you know, the 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 breadth of the piano score offers support. But you know, this is all fun. I really love the the tuned percussion in here, the xylophone, and you know, that's just so much fun. Um, yeah, and then you know, trumpet. So are we still ah two? It seems seems pretty heavy, you know, for this support part. But I really love these trills. Okay, okay. The one thing to think about, though, is like, is that you are assuming that this is the beginning of the phrase, right? But the beginning of the phrase is on the second beat. So what if you went trill, 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 right? If you, what if you just had this start a beat later, right? And then, then this right in here could. Uh, continue on to the next chord, right? So there's like it ends up with a C and a G, right? So so you could just basically just move everything over and have this continue on, and this could just end, yup, up, 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 plink, right? And then change the context of the tuned percussion so it doesn't feel so much like you're going da 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 one two three one but it's because it's, that's not that right it's da 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 two three one two and three and right the phrase really starts here and you know because we have it just continues on doesn't doesn't it you know bum 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 da 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 Two and three and one, two and three and one, two and three and one, right? So that doesn't really start the phrase. The next phrase doesn't. The next phrase starts on the downbeat, like not until here, right? Then pluck, 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 pluck. I, I really love this trade-off, right? It's it's a little strange though. Pizzicato and arco viola, and then we have arco second violin. I'm, I'm wondering if this was maybe. Um, if you if you did you really want I mean I mean it kind of works to a degree like clarinet staccato plus viola right which should have uh, staccato marks on it as well right and then pizzicato which doesn't need staccato marks which is great you left them out and then 
but shouldn't this be pizzicato and shouldn't this be like maybe doubled by bassoon, right? Just to keep the integrity of the of the weight of the parts together. I mean, I, lo I love how you're adding this line right in here and the trill. It's just so gorgeous. It's, it's really, really nice. But I, I feel like things are sort of pulling in different directions. But, you know, having said that, I really love like the contrast between between the parts right in here. And and the, the mock-up brings those, you know, it, it accentuates those contrasts. So, but in practice, will will the parts really sound all that different, right? It, I mean, it'll sound different if, if the players are not attempting to blend into each other, if they're not attempting to... Um, to dovetail the lines together, right? Which is kind of would be their general practice. So the mock-up doesn't know any better. So it is, you know, it is just basically doing what it thinks you want it to do, which is to make a contrast between the two things. But I, I almost feel like you're onto something here. So, you know, pizzicato, arco, pizzicato, arco. I like that contrast. I just, I'm just wondering if it was intentional. That's all. So um, if that is the case, you know, couldn't there also be continued support between some of these, uh, some of these lines that would actually bring out the color, uh, the differentiation of color, right? So you know, if this were like uh, pizzicato uh, plus staccato oboe, and then um, then right in here, if this could be like maybe, you know, like um, like like um, a very soft trumpet, right? So, like, just bring the trumpet into the background so it doesn't overwhelm the part. So, so forte crescendo for the strings, like um, mezzo piano crescendo for the trumpet, right? So, just I mean, there there are just ways of I, I don't want to mess with it too much, but there are ways of just making this stronger, and that like fulfills our last criterion for that, which is like maintaining a driving staccato, transitioning smoothly into the next passage. You know, you, we could sort of hear in the mock-up that you had worked out what, where you wanted to go from here. So, so yeah, so that, so that works out really, really well. I think, I just feel like there's ways of making all of this stronger. You know, like for instance, bigger, more gushing uh, harp rolls right in here would be great. Um, and then, just filling in some accompaniment right in here, right? And, and don't leave gaps like this. There are just so many gaps being left, like, you know, things, sections that are really nicely worked out, and then, like, there's a big gap. And, you know, that the the pattern doesn't continue, or, you know, as in this case, or, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of a, there's sort of a weakness going forwards in, like, trading off one, one line to the other. So... Yeah, but I mean, you know, aside from like all of those little things that I'm picking away at, you know, in my attempt to help you shape this into a, a more beautiful sculpture, I uh, will just say that, you know, the the ingenuity and the creativity here is all your own, right? You know, um, I, I am more in the in the role of a coach or an editor, right? Rather than a creator, you know, or somebody who is really changing your work. I'm just pointing out what can be done to make it even stronger, right? And and more more cohesive, I feel. That's that's something, you know, having things come together in very strong ways. So so yeah, just um really enjoyable score to look at. And you know, just like all of these scores have been so strong and and you know, had had such yeah, such individuality of voice. So with that in mind, I'll thank you again, Tony, uh, for this great entry. And let's go on to the very last evaluation, the very last entry for this group of evaluations. All right, Noah, that is 
you know, once again, another uh, sort of chamber orchestra kind of an approach at first, and then expanding outwards and so on. Just a lot of great, just a lot of really great ideas, a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of very crafty approaches. So let's see, you know, if there's any way that I can help you to improve things. There were a couple of things that occurred to me as I was reviewing this just now, and then I had to listen to your mock-up to see if there was something I could help you with um, that might show up in the mock-up more uh, more than just on the screen. So I have a pretty good idea. I think I can I think I can say this all in the in the context of the criteria. So let's get to that. So pitch weight in the upper register, upper middle register of the piano. Uh, and thematic material repeating often, re sounding repetitive if orchestrated the same way. So, yeah. So, so you you are dealing with this by um, by adding like this this note right here, boom, right? But I missed it the second time, right? Why couldn't it be boom, yum yum yum, bum 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 bum, boom, yum yum yum, bum 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 bum. And then that would be enough of a change. Just that one little change. Just adding this same emphasis on the downbeat again, right? I think that that would just bring enough of a of a contrast between the two parts. And then of course, like you're of course you're adding emphasis on the second beat as well with the horns. And you know, that works too, but it's not enough. Like by the time you get to here, it just sort of feels like the same thing again, right? So, I mean, not just, it's the both parts are nicely, um, are nicely orchestrated, but okay. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about that orchestration a little bit. So I feel like the emphasis is in the wrong place. I think it should be on the second beat here, right? Right. Rather than. Because, like, there's part of the reason why this works so well in the original piano score is because there is rhythmic tension between almost a suggestion of 3 2 and then the, the more nimble 3 4, right? So it's almost like the, the you know, it almost feels like like one and two and three and four and right in in three two and then one two three one and two and three and one and two and three and one and two and three and right so there's that there's that um that that sort of rhythmic syncopation to a degree so so when you when you add a lot of emphasis on the downbeat of the second bar you are taming the sense of syncopation, right? You're just saying, oh yeah, yeah, it's three, four time. Yeah, so here's the downbeat, right? So, so I would just say, play along with Faya's uh, internal uh, mesh, uh, machinations, right? Just you know, be a part of the the sorceress uh, calculations that he is going through. So I I appreciate the you know telling me you know box text. That's very cool for our symbols and then the marimba coming in so but let's not get distracted we have these big um yeah like all of this is playable all these triple and double stops really nice and then i notice here you say okay well this is not no longer intended to be rolled right that's what the bracket would mean and it could also mean that it's meant to be non divisi right? <laughs> or, or the or the two in one, right? So you only have to do it the first time. You don't have to do it the second time. Now, now um, these would both be really easy to play non-divisi, right? Because here, you, especially here, you've got the um, open A, and then you're just fingering the upper A. Now here, um, it's a bit higher, but that's actually easier, right? So the, the higher you get with these octaves, the easier that they get. So they become more like sixths, like the, if you, you know, once you get up into like fourth position, fifth position, sixth position, and so on, the distance between the fingers that are playing the octave just becomes shorter and shorter, and they're easier and easier to play. Uh, not necessarily easier to tune, but that's, it should be okay with just an, an E octave, that's no big deal, or a B octave. 
But, you know, if you're going to put this here, then, you know, you might want to put it right here, just like put a bracket on the first one, right? If you're going to be using brackets to say non, not rolling and, um, and non divisi. In fact, you should say something about it here somewhere, right? And not just assume. Now, I, see, I, I also see, like, you know, you're going to Arco here, so you, you really do want to make sure that it's not, you know, that it's just a standard. But I, I think all you have to say is just non divisi and you're all right. Okay, so so the scoring is is okay. And then you have this big, beautiful, gushing harp roll, but, like, that is that is on top of this all this pizzicato roll, right? So... The way to the way to make the harp stand out is to have a bigger, like a like a three-handed roll, right? By three-handed roll, I mean that you know that the the player is going left, right, left, right. So the left hand is coming over the top. So I would say make this bigger and don't just make it last a beat long. Have it have it continue on, and then you have the overhanging sound of the harp harmony, and that also helps the ear to pick it out. Now, right in here, these harp notes are just not going to be heard. Mezzo forte right? And against marimba. Marimba will just absorb the sound of the harp. And also if there's pizzicato going on in, you know, very ag aggressive active pizzicato going on in the second violins in here, that it'll just absorb the sound of the harp. Now here, if this were bigger and rolled, there would be more of a chance. But it's, you know, still, it's, it's not the strongest place to put a harp. <clears throat> I would say <clears throat> if you really want these sort of plucked sounds to come through you, you're already doing it right you're already adding that here so um, just make sure that this lower F here is plucked by the viola and then the same thing with the lower B in here and then you, you have everything that you would ever possibly wanted from the harp in your accompaniment style it's cool that you're putting <clears throat> this the you know the the activity uh, of the accompaniment style into the into the marimba part in both sections. I think that that's very very you know that's a very valid thing. And the and the way that you've scored this down to mezzo forte means that the marimba has a chance of being heard in a way that the harp doesn't. <clears throat> so moving on um, to then you know to that other concern, which is like the melodic development soaring quite high. Yep, up, 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 up. This is really nicely done. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I like the, the way that it broadens out into an octave melody. And then the then there is a little bit of overlap on three pitches here. Um, piccolo going to flute. And, it's, and then the flute coming back in where the piccolo starts to get a little weak on the F and the D. And then the, just the little chirp at the end. Yeah, see, so, so it's nice. I mean, and, and right, especially right in here, this boom coming in, right? So why couldn't it just be the same thing again? These two pitches right in here, the little timpani right in there, and yeah, same thing. I just think it, it works really, really good. And once again, big, huge roll on the harp, three-handed roll, covering more pitches, lasting longer. And then the harp has a bigger sound and more of a chance to be heard over the horns, right? The, the horns are just going to blast everybody out anyways. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, then, then going on, I really, really love the, um, the measured tremolo here. It's, that's very nicely done. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's, it's also intriguing that you held back on the kind of skyscraping pitches, the soaring pitches going all the way up to the very highest E of the piccolo, right? And you just made it more about being a string sound in, in its strongest, you know, both, you know, all the, all the, all of these three groups of instruments in their strongest possible registers, and then just adding uh, a bit of clarinet and then the oboes to support them. I think that's just really beautiful doubling. It works great, right? And then here you're just ending the phrase and then letting the next ones come in. Ba, 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 yeah, da, 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 da. I think that's very wise to hold off on throwing in the piccolo in this particular interpretation 
And it's very cool that you're adding accented to Nuto, right? So, I mean, just in general, there's so there are so many accents. I'm seeing so many accents in in this that are just you know imported from the score. It's great that you left them out in places and so on. Um, you know, possibly needed even less than we think. You know, like accented, like all of these accented staccatos, right? It's like, do they need to be there or not? So it's just a, it's a separate question for each person who approaches this, right? Whether or not that is necessary. But it's really cool to see, the, um, you know, the the difference of approach here with the tenuto accent. Uh, I think that that's that's also very cool and very valid. Okay, and then of course the doubling of the piccolo. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's still not all that strong, really. But you know, you know, like for instance here, you just really wanted a a very penetrating doubled sound. Then like clarinet is better than than piccolo, right? Because like the piccolo is getting weaker and weaker as it descends. But still, you know, I mean, the way that you have got it scored is is all right, and I really love the, these trills right in here. And, um, and see, here's where I would get rid of the the accents, right? There's there's probably you know in this kind of interpretation, there's probably no need for the horns to have accents on them, right? And then like just a little trumpet in the background, yep, bum 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 bum. You might not even need the crescendo here, right? So like the the balance is okay. It's a little strange though. Fortissimo, right? And then forte crescendo. So and then forte crescendo here. So yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you'd need to work out your dynamics a little bit better. Yeah. I think but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't push the brass right in here. I would let them back off a little bit. So if these are going to go to forte crescendo from a fortissimo, then this should go to mezzo forte and and no crescendo, right? Because it's strong enough, especially like and then throwing in the trombones here. <clears throat> then you know you you like you just really do not need this to be loud. Then of course then we're coming back in marimba. And um, pizzicato plus staccato arco, that's all really really fun. It works really great, and I I love the way that that scored. It's just, it's just too bad we ran out of mar of marimba right in there. You know, maybe if you were working with like a um like a um, a bigger like a five octave marimba, then it's no problem. You can cover pretty much anything that the lower strings are covering up to here, right? Obviously not the double basses, but the you can get all the way down to this E and e, even lower down to C if you need to. So, yeah, I mean, such a cool score. I, I love this this one, like the lower, um, like the the F horn right in here, diminuendo to pianissimo. Yeah, and just to, just that's all the stronger reason to have the brass go down to mezzo forte here, right? Just so that they don't really start to scream. Yeah, like like right in here. I don't. I think staccato is good enough, right? Rather than necessarily having an accent right there, right? I mean, you do have your roll, like the, but yeah, and I and I really love the way that you're going. Yeah, bum 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 da 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 it's just it's great like you're catching the ends of of all of the phrases and little phrase groups right and then here it serves to underline the beginning of the next phrase like where the two overlap so that's you know that's nicely done as well yeah um I, just just one little comment um maybe for everybody who is still listening and is participating or wants to participate in this um Noah, you you submitted the score that had the piano score, the piano stave still on it, and I took them out. And so you're probably noticing a difference between your entry originally as as you sent it to me and this. I just took the piano staves out, and you can just leave the piano staves out because um, you know I th I think that 
like it just takes up too much vertical space. It's nice to have around so people can see oh, what are you thinking, you know, what are you talking about in the piano score. But I think that if it's such such a crucial issue, then people can just go take a look at it themselves, or they can just have, uh, you know, the first page of piano score up on their computer screen and then stop the video and take a look at what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, because like the alternative is like the more things that you have to add vertically, not with this score necessarily because it's not such a huge score, but with other scores, the more the more there more space I have to to uh, compensate for vertically, the smaller the notes have to be in the score, and, and it, it just becomes unreadable, especially when people do not have access to a large screen, right? The ideal way to view these evaluations is on a smart TV, you know, and, and I've actually started to see some, um, some, some people sharing their, uh, them following along with these evaluations. I think one person was watching it on a smart TV with their cat and the cat was just fascinated by the, uh, <laughs> the cursor moving around on the screen. Um, and, uh, yeah, so like that's, that's an example of, of it working really, really well. So, and then of course, like if you have like a larger desktop screen, like, you know, 22 inch or, or larger, then that's, that's also helpful. But like a lot of people will be watching on whatever they can. And, and many times it's a much smaller screen, a, like a, a smaller laptop screen. So I have to watch out for them and I can't, um, I can't always include the piano stave, so I've just been leaving them out as much as possible to help out all of, as many viewers as I can. And of course, it just makes it easier for me to read too. I'm you know, I'm getting older. It's my eyesight is not what it used to be. So, anyways, so thanks everybody. Thanks to all of my website subscribers. Thank you to my Patreon supporters for making this possible and for coming in here and leaving comments. I'm noticing that a lot of Patreon supporter comments on the website. Uh, evaluations and look if you can return the favor uh, website subscribers and comment on their evaluations that would be really really great and also um, if everybody who I just evaluated in this video can comment on each other's uh, evaluations in this video um, uh, whether it's on the post on YouTube or maybe in Facebook on either of those platforms uh, that would be really helpful and just really keep the energy going, the sense of community coming together. Um, really, really happy at the way it's going so far. And I don't want things to start to slump as I start getting into more and more difficult territory. You know, um, I'll be evaluating longer and longer excerpts from uh, our Patreon uh, contributors. And then I'll, I'll also be, um, you know, kind of getting into the point where um, I'm, I'm starting to see, you know, um, you know, I'll get to like the 40th and then the 60th, um, and, uh, uh, evaluation from the, uh, website subs subscribers and, you know, everything is fresh and everything is new. It's as fresh as the person who is bringing it to me. So that's not really the problem. The problem is kind of doing it in a vacuum, right? So, so long as the, energy continues out there with people's comments. It's just so important to me here sitting in my studio, um, my little study in in the middle of Wellington, um, kind of looking out at the springtime starting to break out, out my window. That would really help me feel that this is all worth it and that I should continue doing it in years to come. Thanks everybody so much and there will be another group evaluation coming down the pike very, very soon.